Bill, we've been talking about Hawking's book, The Grand Design, and we want to spend some more time on this. Check out some of the resources we have at reasonablefaith.org, an interview that you did on this, and some other things as well as a, a past podcast. But some other issues that Hawking and his co-author bring up in this book, let's discuss that. One of them would be the realism-anti-realism debate. Now, that sounds like a big philosophical question. Well, it is a philosophical question, Kevin. This is one of the most important questions in the philosophy of science. And it's ironic that in a book, the second paragraph of which pronounces the death of philosophy (laughs) and says that philosophy is dead and that now it's up to scientists to bear the torch of discovery in the quest for knowledge— It's ironic that the first third of this book would then plunge into a philosophical discussion about realism and anti-realism in science. And for me, this was part of the uh, most interesting sections of the book because they weren't dealing here with fine-tuning or the origin of the universe. It was just straight philosophy of science. And I thought, this is so bizarre. On the one hand, they think philosophy is dead— and that scientists are going to answer these questions, and then they find themselves immediately immersed in a profound philosophical discussion. And I I thought, don't they understand what they're doing? Don't they realize that they are practicing philosophy? But in any case, Hmm. that's, that's what the first part of the book is about. About a third of it is on a discussion about realism and anti-realism in science. How, to what extent do our theories really describe the way the world is? Do they tell us how the world really is, or are they just constructs in our minds that help us get by practically, but they don't really give us any knowledge of the way the world is? So in a way, you can construct your own reality is, uh, I mean, is there an external world? Well, that's the question that is raised by anti-realism. And although they characterize their theory as what they call model-dependent realism, in fact, Kevin, it's not realism at all. Hawking and Mladenov are deeply committed to anti-realism about science. They believe that scientific models are simply constructs of the human mind and that they do not tell us about the way the world really is. Hmm. Is there a difference between anti-realism and skepticism? I mean, is it that if you're an anti-realist, then it's difficult to get at reality, and so you're skeptical about what you're observing or what you think? Yes, it would be skepticism, at least with respect to the way the world is. Here's what they say on page seven of their book. They say, if two physical theories or models accurately predict the same events, one cannot be said to be more real than the other. Rather, we are free to use whichever model is most convenient. Now, what's significant about that is that they say that if these two physical theories or models predict the same results, It's not just that we don't know which one is correct and which one is false, but rather that they say one is not more real than the other. It is purely a matter of convenience which one you want to use and that these are not more or less approximations of reality. These two competing theories, neither of which, neither of them connect with reality to tell us the way reality really is. Wow. Didn't Kant bring up some of these issues? You can know some. Yeah, Kant was an anti-realist. He thought that space and time were constructs of the intellect and that we cannot really know reality as it is in itself. And therefore, all we know is reality as it appears to us. And so one way to interpret Hawking and Mladenov would be as Kantians, that all we know is the world of appearance. We don't know reality as it is in itself. That would be one spin to put on it. And just how seriously they take this, Kevin, is evident on pages 50 and 51 of their book. Let me quote what they say in contrasting young earth creationism with modern Big Bang cosmology. They say, St. Augustine said that time was a property of the world that God created and that time did not exist before the creation 
which he believed had occurred not that long ago. That is one possible model, which is favored by those who maintain that the account given in Genesis is literally true, even though the world contains fossil and other evidence that makes it look much older. So that's a description of young earth creationism. The world is not really all that old, even though it contains these various appearances of age, and that's one possible model. They go on to say one can also have a different model in which time continues back 13.7 billion years to the Big Bang. The model that explains the most about our present observations, including the historical and geological evidence, is the best representation we have of the past. The second model can explain the fossil and radioactive records and the fact that we receive light from galaxies millions of light years from us. And so this model, the Big Bang Theory, is more useful hmm. than the first. Notice he doesn't say more true or more correct than the first. It's more useful than the first. Then they go on to say, still, neither model can be said to be more real than the other. Wow. So Big Bang cosmology is on a par with young Earth creationism, in their view, in terms of its approximation to reality, the way the, real, the world really is. Neither of these can be said to be more real or more approximately true. All they can be said to be is more useful than the other or more convenient. So this is how radical an anti-realism they have that these two cosmologists would think that in terms of reality, young earth creationism, while less useful and convenient, is on a par with their own Big Bang model of the universe. There, there is no truth about how the universe originated. And what's important for the listener to understand is that when they say that, they do not mean, yes, one is more useful than the other, and we don't know which one is more approximately true. We don't know which one is a better description of reality. That's not what they're saying. They're saying neither of them approximates to reality. They're just models, and neither model can be said to be more real or more correct than the other. This is a, a, an anti-realist view of science where all we have are useful constructs, but none of them can be said to be more approximately real or true than another. That really bothers me. Oh, it's, uh, it's incredible. Well, even if you're a staunch anti-realist like that, it's as if even to hold the view, you have to have some backdrop of reality to determine what approximates. This most approximates reality, but we don't know. I mean, you you're know making what I mean? a good um, point, Kevin. It's like illusionism. If you think that all is an <laughs> illusion, you'd have to have a backdrop of reality in order to say this is reality and this is an illusion. So yes. you need something to compare. Yes. Now, if you're an anti-realist, there's nothing to even approximate. And that um, is why people who are anti-realists, who are philosophers of science, are not anti-realists about everything. They are anti-realist with regard to these very high-level theoretical constructs like quarks or strings or other unobservables of quantum physics. But they're not anti-realists about dinosaurs, for example, they would say that when we postulate dinosaurs as the best explanation for these fossil remains in the earth, we are getting at reality. There really were these animals that once roamed the earth and left these vestiges that nobody is an anti-realist about dinosaurs. But Hawking and Milotinov are anti-realists, not just about these theoretical entities, they're, they're anti-realists about everything. Listen what they say on page seven. They say, our brains interpret the input from our sensory organs by making a model of the world. When such a model is successful at explaining events, we tend to attribute to it and to the elements and concepts that constitute it, the quality of reality or absolute truth. But there may be different ways in which one could model the same physical situation with each employing different fundamental elements and concepts. And they say when that's the case, one cannot be said to be more real than the other. 
So they're applying this model, not just to high theoretical events in, in physics, unobservables. They're applying it to all of reality, our observations, uh, everything that we have through the sensory input of our brains. And that runs into the problem that you mentioned. If everything is ultimately illusory in a construct of our minds, then how can you make any sort of objective judgment about what is most convenient, what best makes the predictions? Because you have no knowledge of anything. It's all a construction of your mind. What are the theological implications of this? If, if this view were to take hold, would it play into the hands of uh, naturalism? or uh, I, I don't think hard-headed naturalists would want this at all. This is postmodernism. Yeah, is what yeah. this is. This is radical postmodernist anti-realism that says we have no knowledge really of anything in the world. All we know are our linguistic constructs and we get along with what works well, but these cannot be said to more or less approximate reality. And it gets even worse, Kevin, because later in the book, Hawking and Mladenov move from this sort of anti-realism to a kind of ontological relativism where they say that the model creates its own reality. So it's not, in fact, just a matter of having different models. There are different realities for different people. What this means is that if the model creates its own reality, that for Fred Hoyle, who held to the steady state model, the universe really does exist eternally mm -hmm. in a steady state. But for Stephen Hawking, the universe really did begin 13.7 billion years ago. The, the, the reality is different from observer to observer. So for the ancient physician Galen, blood really did not circulate through the human body. But for William Harvey, who discovered circulation, blood really does circulate through the human body. So on this view, the model actually creates its own reality and people with different models literally inhabit different worlds, different realities. This is a radical form of ontological relativity according to which the, the world has fallen apart and there is no objective reality. There is only the reality for me, the world for me, and yeah. each observer creates his own reality. We've been dealing with this for quite some time, that truth is relative and what's true mm -hmm. for you may not be true for me and you create your own truth and your own yeah. reality. And you hear this a lot in, in popular language. So this, this tends to kind of reinforce that a little bit. I, I guess. A little bit. It, it is it, Kevin. <laughs> it this is, it, is, it. Or is it radical postmodernist anti-realism uh, and non-objectivism. I was trying to be modest. So yeah, it really <laughs> does reinforce it, doesn't it? Uh, well, that has a certain appeal to people who don't want you to impose your view on them. Yes. Uh, I, I, that's why I think people really like this ontological relativism, moral relativism, truth is relative type thing, because they don't want their Aunt Edna shoving <laughs> religion down their throat. I mean, you Yeah, know. I think that's right. Although I find it odd because the people to whom the Hawking and Mladenov type appeal is generally your Richard Dawkins, new atheist yeah. type who want to get rid of God and believe that God does not exist. But on this theory, for me, God really does exist. He, he created the Big Bang and he is just as real as this table. He's as real as I am for me mm -hmm. on this view, even if for Richard Dawkins, God doesn't exist. So I mean, think of that. The, the model creates its own reality. Mm. It means that God really exists uh, in some people's model, and he really doesn't in others. And so this would completely undermine the new atheist claim that there is no God. On this view, there is a God, and the young earth creationist is just as much within his rights, believing what he does, as the atheist naturalist is in believing what he does. Well, we're all just one big happy family. Uh, for a book that says philosophy is dead, it sure goes into a lot of philosophy. <laughs> exactly. And that was my my overriding point is that it, it just exposes the pretentiousness and naivete of that opening paragraph 
that it is scientists now who are bearing the torch of discovery. Uh, philosophy is dead. This is pure philosophy, Kevin, and yeah. it is amateurish philosophy, ultimately. 